Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, Leadership of the House, and Honorable Members. First, I'd like to dedicate this moment to the good people of Nigeria, the people of Kogi State who led the land, and in particular, the people of Ibera. What I also would like to put a dedication to is the people of Russia and the Soviet Union. I'm, war, I'm just standing here and wondering why with all the clamor and appreciation for the magnificent structure that stands there, not one person actually appreciated the brains behind who dreamt this big dream for Nigeria. I stand here today as a direct product of the relationship between the two countries. Mr. Speaker, it's an honor to meet you. I've heard so much about you, and I and other Nigerians, they are greatly inspired by you. And thank you so much in this honorable house for taking time to visit the Moribund Steel Plant. And I'm greatly honored that you were inspired and moved by the vision which has laid idle. And if you permit me, I will make this as brief as possible, but if I skip a little bit beyond the 15, 20 minutes I'm granted, please, we've waited 40 years, and I believe truth is very essential to moving forward. So I have in my hands here the Nigerian Constitution, and I read chapter 2, section 16, which says, the state shall, within the context of the ideals and objectives for which provisions are made in this constitution, A, harness the resources of the nation and promote national prosperity and an efficient and dynamic and self-reliant economy. I also go to C, which states, without prejudice to these rights to operate and participate in areas of the economy other than the major sectors of the economy, manage and operate the major sectors of the economy. That means Nigeria, the government, is saddled with the responsibility to manage major sectors such as the steel industry. I'll go to C, 2C, which states, that the economic system is not that the economic system is not operated in such a manner that means the government is going to ensure that the economic system is not operated in such a manner as to permit the concentration of wealth or the means of production and exchange in the hands of few individuals or a group of people three a body shall be set up by the act of the National Assembly, which shall have power to review from time to time the ownership and control of business enterprises operating in Nigeria and make recommendations to the president on the same. That means what is going on here, the debate that we hold so preciously, is actually in line and in tune with the functions of this honorable house. So the people of Nigeria are greatly appreciative of this. And we hope that at the end of today, no matter how brutal the truth that we may be faced with, we do not just let this day pass by like another day and another session that has held in the past. We, myself and the marginalized Nigerians, are actually holding you all in trust. And today also, the over 3,000 Nigerians that were trained in Russia, many of them died. Many people like myself, mixed race, blood, who were left motherless and fatherless. I honor and I dedicate this day to them. So, the previous speakers have taken time to speak, Martin mostly about the functions of Ajakuta still is more than a still plant. But what I would say today, especially with reference to the very last speaker, Barrister, any private sector, any private player, whoever feels he has the capacity, the financial capability, and technicalities to operate a steel plant is very free to do so. Sir, you said you would need 100 million or 300 million dollars. We have enough land in Nigeria, and we can give you one to start your steel plant. But the Jakuta as it stands today is not 
of commercial concern. It's a political and economic play. As we all know, just two days ago, Trump, President Trump of America said that he's going to do everything possible to revive the steel sector in America because of what it stands, the work, because of what the people of America stand to gain with regards to job creation, even if it means increasing the tax tariffs for import steel. That is what Nigeria needs. It has nothing to do with sentiments of financial cap of, of money. And I'd like to say one more thing. Political will is one of the reasons why Ajakuta is laying moribund. And all the money in the world, and all the technical expertise, even if every Nigerian today here becomes a steel expert, a metallurgist at that, if you do not have the political will and the decision from your heart, a patriotic movement, and leaders in place that will have this idea and share the same vision, Ajakuta will not move. So permit me, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to put before the nation a few of such conspiracies with respect to the few individuals we would mention. I would not in any way or manner speak of anything that I do not have proof for. I'm very much aware of the risk that this befalls me. In 1994, when the Russians left, it was definitely the Soviet Union, I would call the company in particular, Tiaja from Export. When they left in 1994, Jakuta was 98.2% completed. I have that in the letter they wrote two years ago to the president. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I would gladly share the letter with you at your call. And when they left, it was likely because Nigeria fell short on its contractual agreement. They were not paying, they were not putting forth funds. And the supporting infrastructure that would be needed to bring to place, all the other resources were not in place. But that aside, Nigeria should know that we have several times had good opportunities to have the steel sector running. The very first was in 2001 under President Olusha Obasanjo. Two years ago when I visited Russia, I visited the People's University in Moscow. And right there in the hall, there's a big picture of President Oluk Shagun Basanjo. And I asked, why is this picture here amongst other leaders of the world? And they said, he visited this university in 2001 when he visited Putin. And then I got curious, why did he visit President Putin? And then I got to know that on March 7, 2001, there was actually a bilateral agreement entered into between Nigeria and Russia in furtherance to the transfer of high technology. And Ajakuta still was actually, and Ajakuta still was actually one of the issues. Based on that bilateral agreement and others, 40 steel experts were sent by the same company, the original builders, Jerusalem Experts. And they worked here alongside with Nigerian experts to develop the technical and financial reports, which were supposed to be used to formalize the revival and modernization of Ajakuta steel plant. But after that, surprisingly, the Nigerian side went quiet. In 2003, President Putin sent a letter, wrote a letter to President Obasanjo. Mr. Speaker, it's a short letter. Do you mind if I read that? It reads, Dear Mr. President, as we mentioned to you during our meetings in Moscow in March 2001, trade and economic cooperation between the Russian Federation and the Federal Republic of Nigeria has significant potential, good prospects for further development and deepening of relations. One of the important directions of cooperation between our countries in this sphere in the completion of construction and commissioning of metallurgical plant in Ajakuta town. The realization of this plant will contribute to the solution of a number of economic and social challenges faced by Nigeria in a strategic nature, setting an example of partnership in the field of industry and high technologies to lay the foundation for new joint plants in the energy sector telecommunications and petroleum refinery. He went further to say, the Russian side has completed the preparation of technical proposals for the company in Ajakuta 
and worked through issues of financial provision. We hope the state enterprise, Diageprom Export, and its partner in Nigeria, which is the ministry, will soon be able to successfully conclude negotiations on this large-scale project and to begin its realization. Using this opportunity, Mr. President, I would like to confirm our mindset to a comprehensive strengthening of Nigerian-Russian relations. Yours faithfully, Vladimir Putin. I would like to say that at this point, the technical reports were already submitted to the Nigerian side. That's the ministry. And Russia had gone ahead to secure the monies for, that will be used to complete the plan from BNP Paribas. Two months after, President Olushego of Asenjo responded. In his response, the only place where he mentioned Ajakuta, I'll read this. First of all, allow me to thank you for your kind message. Ajakuta really occupies an important place in our agenda, and I appreciate the fact that you also find this project a priority in our bilateral relations. I will not bore you with the rest of the content, but it has to do with supply of military equipment and stuff. That was the response our president gave in response to the letter from Putin. And the very next month after this letter, Ajakuta Steel and Niyomko, which is the iron ore company in Itape, we are given to a company called Solgas. Solgas Energy at that time was not qualified and had, well, permit me, I'm not supposed to give my own opinions. Solgas Energy was given the concession of Ajakuta and Itape. And if this honorable, court, this honorable house recalls, probably from your archives, this, there was a session called a few months after because the house was worried that no activities were, take, were being taken, were, was taking place in Itakpe and Ajakuta. And the conclusion there to Solgas was they should go to Russia and call, partner with the original builders as technical experts. But they went to India and brought in Iceblood, what is known today as Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited. So in truth, the Indian company that we so know today was brought in as technical partners to sell gas. So from then on, I will not bore you again, but the facts are all there. Nigeria entered due to, I would not, maybe probably should I say the mistake that President Obolisha of Asinger got when conducted, where for some reason he found Solgas more qualified than the people who actually built that place. That is one on one part. The second part of it, I will say here, because if the minister were to be here, he would have talked about the arbitration in England, in the courts. So I would briefly brush through that. On the 2nd of April, 2008, at the Federal Executive Council, the Federal Executive Council met and late Yaradua terminated the concession. I quote late Yaradua, after considering the report of the administrative panel of inquiry established by the Yaradua administration to review the concession agreements and determine the extent of compliance by both parties, the council agreed with its findings that the agreements were largely skewed in favor of the concessionaire to the detriment of the federal government of Nigeria. I have the report here. This is the Inua Magaji report, duly certified by the Ministry of Solid Minerals. It contains documents, facts, and figures and even pictorial evidences of the vandalization that took place. I am surprised why Nigeria did not present this before the courts in England and rather said we have no proof. How can we have no proof? Why did the solid mineral, the minister, Andre Bokayode Fayemi, reconcession it had been back to the same people that vandalized it because there was no proof? This is the proof.
In my hands, I also have the rules of. In my hands, I also have. A I also have the rules of the International Chamber of Commerce. The arbitration court had its first session, and this is the rules. From this report, when I read back, I read from page to page. It is signed here, duly, by the ex-Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Belo Adoki. I could tell here that Nigeria was clearly winning the case. If you read these rules, Mr. Speaker, I will submit this to Kandi Chi. He will tell them there was no reason for Nigeria to settle for out of court, go for out of court settlement. If we had proceeded this diligently, we would have had a Chakutani Tape back in our hands. Well, it says in our hands technically, but for some clauses. Because towards the end, you could clearly state. It states here, in 9.2.3, claimants, who is the global infrastructure, because it took us to court, claimants have not demonstrated enough, claimants have not proved enough sufficient evidence that they will suffer irrepar irreparable harm. All the points here were claimants have not demonstrated, claimants have not demonstrated. So you may read this, Nigeria was clearly winning. But to our surprise, the Attorney General applied for an out-of-court settlement and President Jonathan granted. The out-of-court settlement, the out-of-court settlement brought about the reconcession agreement. And the terms of the reconcession agreement stated that Itakwe should be given back to Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited because Nigeria owes Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited $525 million. If you recall, the Minister, Honorable Kayode Fayemi, said several times that it was the court in London that actually told us to pay that amount. And Nigeria does not have $525 million. Therefore, the only option we have is to give them, give it back to them to complete their eight years. Uh, seven, they complete the 10 years since they had done three years. Permit me, I would like to read from the letter, the memo the Attorney General Adoke wrote to President Jonathan on the 12th of December. It's duly signed by his signature, after each page attested. Item six, item six A. In light of the fact that a presidential committee had estimated damages, please, I'm going to go through this again because it's very important. Item 6A reads, in light of the fact that a presidential committee had estimated damages payable to global in the region of $525 million, million the agreement of global to waive its right to damage a substantial achievement. This shows you that there was a presidential committee that was cooked up, put together, people of like mind promoting a particular interest. And it was that committee that actually indicted Nigeria to the amount of $525 million. It is not the courts in England, sir. It was a committee. And I do have a list of the members of the committee, which I will share with you later. <laughs> I would just say, I would just say that it was headed by the vice president, that's Sambo. That's, that's it. <laughs> but people from the attorney general's office. People from, representative from BPE, they were all present, sir. So going by this proof, it shows that our country is not binded by, the, by such a decision of a committee. And I would like this honorable court to demand the, the sorry, forgive me.
Okay. I would like to appreciate this honorable house to demand for the report of that committee. It would be interesting to know the parameters in which they arrived at such a decision. Knowing full well that there was also the Inwa Magadji report, which clearly itemized the damage, and even the monies borrowed from CBN without being paid, and proved that there was no money that was brought into Nigeria. So we begin to understand, imagine $525 million. So going by this, it will not be wrong to say that the agreement which was entered in the office of the Vice President of Sibanjo on the 1st of August 2016 is null and void because in law you cannot give what you don't have and you cannot take what is not yours. So by this, Nigeria does not owe global infrastructure $525 million and so they have no right to spend a day in Niamco. Furthermore, I would like to state that right here in my hands, I have before me, this is the reconcession agreement that Adokate tried, tried to have effected before the termination of uh, Good Luck Jonathan's administration. And here in my left hand, I have the reconcession agreement Fiamme entered in August 1st. It will interest you to know that the two agreements are the same. When I read both, the errors, even the typographical errors, the typographical errors contained in Adoki's concession agreement are also contained. There are over 25 of them. So you begin to wonder, did he review this agreement? Or it is the same agreement that later I do what terminated, which he said was grossly shrewd against the interest of Nigeria. So it's left for this court, this house, to decide. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say that it's such a great honor to know that for once I have seen someone in authority whose ideals resonate with mine and the good people of Nigeria. We are against the privatization or concession or whatever it is called. Ajakuta is too important to be in the hands of an individual left to roam a foreign country. A company that has a capacity of manufacturing weapons should not be held in the hands of anybody. I mean, considering the fact that we tend to focus more in our diversity here, what betide it be in the hands of an Ibera or an Ibo man or a Hausa? It should be a property of the Nigeria, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, sir. So, and I will tell you that the idea of privatization tends to create a lot of green-eyed monsters. The idea that somebody can own such a magnificent structure creates such uncontrollable greed. And I will speak about this. Sometime last year, it got to my findings that a particular company was registered to acquire Ajakuta. It's called Ajakuta Kogi Nigeria Limited. I have before me the papers that prove that this company was authorized the registration of this company was authorized by the governor of Kogi State, Alaji Ahaya Bello, in partnership with Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited, the same people. Now they have gotten Itakpe into their hands, and the next target was to acquire Ajakuta at all costs. So they devised the means. And going by the, the certified true copy of the form CAC7, form CA7, the two, a company that is supposed to carry the front and the interests of the people of Kogi State, if, well, let's, we know it's a, it's a federal asset, but supposing the Federal Republic of Nigeria has given Kogi State the mandate to proceed with ownership, resuscitation, and operations of Ajakuta, you will all assume that Kogi State should be a major shareholder, isn't it? 
But what I have here, the two directors of this company, one, Okechuk, Onoche Ikechuku, he's from Benue State, and Anchaba Emmanuel from the eastern part of Nigeria. And both of them, it would interest you, are affiliates, staff of Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited. Both of them share no other directories here. This is a shell company, sir. If it had succeeded, do you mind looking at this? If it had gone through, we would have, on the face of it, assumed that Ajakuta was then already in, in possession of Kogi State, probably working for the good people of Kogi State and Nigeria. Well, in reality, it's just a company that is owned by two people who are promoting vested interests. So we wrote a petition. On the 3rd of July, we wrote a petition to the Registrar, Gen to Registrar General of CAC. And he was very shocked. I wouldn't bore you with the, with the happenings there, but he was very shocked. And he ordered a committee, to, his, to the best of his knowledge, the files before him did not contain that the company was registered. Meanwhile, it was registered already months before then. So I will receive this first letter stating that the file had been quarantined and a committee was set up and they were going to investigate. May I read the first line? From my investigation, it was discovered that the above named company, which was meant to be registered as a special purpose vehicle by the Kogi state government for the concession of Ajakuta Steel Company, does not capture the legal representation of Kogi state. This has therefore defeated the essence of giving consent to the registration of Ajakuta Kogi Nigeria Limited as a special purpose vehicle of the Kogi state government. But I was surprised again a few months after when I received another letter from this same corporate affairs commission. By then, the gentleman, the registrar general had retired and there was an actor who is still acting now, a lady, I'm told. And they told me, the letter reads, that they have allowed the company to proceed. CAC does not have the right to regularize an illegality. If by going by their act, if there's a fraud committed upon registration or the content or the context in which a company is registered, it should go for the registration. Uh, then if the company wants to proceed, they have to apply again. When I spoke with a few people at CAC, I was told there were orders from above. I said, who? They said the Kogi State Governor sent the Commissioner Idris Asiwaju, and they were pressures from the presidency. I would like to state that I believe President Buhari would not sanction this, but there are many people who lie in the president's name. Finally, I'm going to the conclusions. Oh, permit me, please, in searching. Yeah. Finally, dear Honorable House, if the Minister, if the Minister of Finance were to be here, we would have posed a very important question to her. Along the lines and reasoning of the speaker, how can, how can we say that Nigeria does not have the financing capabilities to revive Ajakuta? No, it's not true. We do have the funds. But I will tell you the easiest of all. Many of us have heard about the Abacha loot, but few of us have actually, few of us have actually bothered to find out what amounts to the Abacha loot. I would read a report from a United Nations report. A United Nations report put forward in, 2000, uh, in 1998, and it states, in another stunning disclosure, a government spokesman said in December that the administration was investigating an alleged $2 billion fraud by some members of the previous regime 
They were carefully mentioned in the previous regime. This involved the withdrawal in 1996 of 2.5 billion of public funds, 2.5 billion dollars of public funds, to settle debts owed to Russia for the construction of the Ajakuta steel plant. But which in reality had been discounted to only $500 million. I'm going to explain that. In a secretly negotiated debt buyback deal, local and foreign media reports have speculated that General Abacha may have more than $3 billion stashed away in overseas bank. This was in 1996. May I talk about the debt buyback, sir? By the time the Russians left, in 1994, Nigeria was owing them close to a billion dollars. Because long before the change in administration actually affected the funding. It would also interest this house to know that three years before TPE, which is the original builders, left the country, Every month for three years, they were writing memos to the Ministry of Mines and Steel, or however it was called then. Not one letter was responded. Three years, from 1991 to 1994, there was a status report telling them that, look, we are nearly completing the plant, but we cannot complete the 2% because we need the infrastructure set up. Because once the 2%, which is largely the blast furnace, once it's ignited, the blast furnace is to run for 18, 25 years nonstop. That means, many people say, why, if the Russians really wanted Ajakuta to work, why did they leave at 2%, at 98%? It's because if they had started, would have had a whole some damage. And for these three years, which was more than enough to have the infrastructure running, the roads dredging. At that time, they even proposed the dredging of River Niger. But not one letter was responded to, and they had to leave. It was a sad experience, they had to leave. It was more sad because, like I said, people like me, many Russians that came to Nigeria and got married to Nigerians, they, had to, they were separated. My mother till today does not even have a Nigerian passport, even though my father wasn't working for it, but the rules were not so fair to many people. So when they left, I'll read now. In October, okay, when the Russians left and we had such huge debt to pay, they did not take Nigeria to court. They kept on sending letters of reminder. How are you going to pay this? But most importantly, they reminded Nigeria, if you are interested in continuing the completion of your plant, let us know. We will come back. All we have to is renegotiate. But what happened was, in October 1995, I'm going to read from this part because it's, there are some key words I don't want to miss. A series of debt buyback transactions took place whereby the debt instruments were sold at inflated prices to Liberian companies, purport purportedly owed by the Apaches. The two companies are called Parna Shipping Corporation and Mecosta Securities. These are two companies that were registered in Liberia, and these are the two companies that bought the debt by the debts. Now on one part, Pana Shipping Corporation and Mecosta Securities, on one part, they were negotiating the reduction of that near $1 billion debt. And Russia waved away over 400 million. I said, you know what? You're a struggling country, a small country, just pay $500 million. Forget about the rest. While on the other hand, the Abacha administration told Nigeria that the Russians insisted on the money on the nearly one billion, and apart from that, there were debts incurred upon the debt buyback. So that amounted to 2.5 billion. So that means 2.5 billion were taken from our reserve, while only 500 billion was being paid. So that is the debt buyback. So it's not wrong to say, any Abacha look that is left in the banks of Switzerland and other banks can actually be pulled together to revive Ajakuta. On the other hand, if 
Such monies are not enough. I can say with my interactions with ordinary Nigerians, to crowdfund that project. Mr. Speaker, just two years ago, oh no, in 1994, that's four years ago, forgive me. 2014, 2014. The Egyptian government embarked upon a huge project to dualize the Suez Canal. And that Suez Canal, the President Sisi sold the idea so patriotically to the people that $8 billion was raised in 10 days. Mr. Speaker, these are facts. $8 billion was raised in 10 days from a country that has a population of just 91 million. They, are not, they don't have individuals as rich as Nigeria. But what matters is leadership and the ability to connect to the people so that an average person on the street, the person roasting corn, the organizer, everybody will believe in this national dream and vision and know that they are one penny, just like the movement that brought in our beloved President Buhari. That movement, we can make it happen to Nigeria. But we must be patriotic enough and be able to present to the people accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, and an untampered growth. Nigerians can raise the money, sir. I can put my everything to it. So I'm going to read the conclusions we have put. That one, this Honorable House considers that the Neomco's reconcession of August 1st to Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited or Global Steel Holdings and however they are called be terminated with immediate effect. That EFCC must be called to conclude the prosecution of Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited for the economic crimes according to the orders of this investigation and the orders of Leti Adua. May I read the publication here of 3rd of April 2008. President Omaru Musa Yaradua also ordered the arrest and prosecution of all government officials and promoters of Global Infrastructure Nigeria Limited indicted of asset stripping in the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. May I tell you, sir, that last year, in February of last year, we wrote to EFCC to reopen the fire. We wrote several times. We're actually in court with them, seeking an order of mandamus, which will compel EFCC to either reopen the case over the file to us and we will pull a team of patriotic lawyers and get this justice for the people of Nigeria. So sir, there's a pending case there because we believe, we believe that a crime against Ajakuta is a crime against Nigeria. And there is no court, supposing yes, supposing this $525 million was actually an order of the greatest court on earth. Nigeria is a sovereign nation, and we decide to allow criminals or not to allow, allow criminals into our land, whether they are nationals, Nigerians, or foreign. So, sir, it's actually Nigeria's duty to ensure that people who have committed crimes on this land are not holding our most precious assets. Also, we would say that Ajakuta and Itape must not be privatized or concession, but be owned 100% by the federal government of Nigeria and operated alongside the original builders only in areas of technical expertise. And once the, there is an absolute transfer of technology, the Russians can go. We believe we have seen Nigerians around the world conducting amazing things in engineering. So there's no reason why they shouldn't. We would also like to appeal that this Honorable House asks to get the executive to assemble a team of economic experts to travel to Russia, which I'm speaking with regards to the bilateral agreement which is still 
but which is still opening, standing open. Because we believe that once a country or two countries come together and agree on a particular reasoning, then that is binding on the, on the nations. It's upon meeting with President Putin that Nigeria can then begin to decide a way forward. And I also agree with the previous speakers that there has to be a redesign of the steel sector. Why a redesign? Because when I visited Russia two years ago and I spoke with the original builders, they told me that the plan upon which the Nigeria steel industry is built, it was designed in 1971 by the ecological survey, ge geological survey conducted by these same original builders. And they said by now, the advancement of technologies and innovation in the sector has caused the realization and usage of new materials which were ordinarily not known to them then. They also told me that we might be oblivious of the fact that Rolls Royce today, the great Rolls Royce, uses important alloys sourced from Cookie State, probably supplied by illegal miners. But that is why I say it is very important that we call them back to conduct another survey, because probably in the modernization and upgrade of the plant, there could be new sectors that are injected so that new minerals can be incorporated. Thank you. And um, by and large, that is what we have. I've come to an end of this presentation. And I would say again that I know many would talk about why am I promoting Russia? Why am I not promoting China and India? With due respect to every country's steel capabilities, the greatest steel plant in China today and five of the biggest steel plants in India, citing Belial, which for the 12th consecutive year, year has won the best steel plant in Asia, was built by this same company. So why, this is a very big question, what has Russia done and why are we shying away from approaching the people who actually envisage this dream for completion? Nigeria must be ready for sanctions. That's one thing I'm gonna say. It's not easy to go against the Western bloc. We must be ready for sanctions because at the end of the day, we must dream of a big, great Nigeria because for all it's worth, Trade is always better than aid. Trade is always better than aid. Nigeria should position itself to be a country that will give other African countries aid. We should be the country that Ghana, Kenya, Somalia, Uganda, they run to for loans. Not all of us scrambling for loans from the Chinese. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Honorable House. And thank you, the good people of Nigeria and the good people of Nigeria land and for this state. Thank you. And Russia, too. Thank you, Russia. I will catch you now. I thought I knew the direction this is the take and more from the Ever before. Honorable um, colleagues.